99% confidence in standard deviations, right? So all of them are based on this bell shape. Even the bell shape curve looks like that. Okay. Um, okay. But most of the things happen like that, and I mean, for me, it's a very intriguing question as to why it should happen according to a Gaussian itself. Why not some other? I mean, Lorentzian is another one which is much rarer. But then why? Okay. You will definitely study all these things later in your maths course, I'm sure. Huh? There, there must be some statistics course, I'm sure. Okay. Anyway, so the thing to notice is that all these her hermite polynomials. Now, once you solve, so her, you know, this is all from old time mathematics, 1800s or something. All these hermite polynomials were solved. The same thing happened to be applied here, so you could solve this problem. Now, the hermite polynomials are given like this. Uh, I have a table given over here. Okay, one thing, one word of caution. Now, different books use different notations or nomenclature or whatever you wish to call that. For example, I said alpha square is equal to mu k by h cross square. Atkins uses it other ways. So Atkins says y is equal to x by alpha. I have written y square, but it should be y. Y is equal to x by alpha, and alpha is equal to h h cross square by n k to the power one by four. Okay. So be very careful what notation you are following. I will follow the one that I have told you. And I have also mentioned over here that this is Atkins notation. Okay. So Atkins says y is equal to h by alpha and the other book that I uh, followed was uh, y is equal to square root alpha times x. So in one case it is square root alpha, in one case it is 1 by alpha. So it just changes the meaning of it. But the science does not change still. Huh? So, how might polynomials I was there? So, you have already seen the first Hermite polynomial. So, h0 is 1, h of 1 is 2y, h of 2 is 4y square minus 2. 0, 1, 2, let's write another one. 8 y cube minus 12 y. And so on and so forth, it goes on. Do you notice anything in these? Huh? Sorry? Highest power is. The leading term depends on the quantum number. That is, the quantum number is equal to the power of the leading term. Okay. Anything wrong? Anything else that you notice over here? No. Yes. Yes. So the thing is that what you have over here is okay. So there is this one which is an odd function of y. Okay. And sorry, odd function, even odd, even odd. Right? And these have that and the Gaussian, the e to the power minus y square by 2 is always an even function. So the moment you multiply an even function with another even function, it remains even. If you multiply even with odd, it, it gets to be odd. So if I have where to plot the second wave function, that is psi 1, then that's 2y passes through the origin, and then I have a uh, this Gaussian over here, 
right? All I need to do is to multiply this. So if I multiply the two functions, the Hermit program is so this is uh, sorry e to the power minus y squared by two, and this green fellow is two y. If I multiply, then what I get is essentially a function of this form. Symmetric. Oh, sorry, anti-symmetric, but this y is negative here, this entire thing comes out to be negative. And uh, if you see, y is trying to increase the function, whereas the exponential decay is trying to bring it down. But exponential is made up of all powers of y. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, till infinity. So no matter what power of y you choose, at some point of time, the exponential will win over, right? And if I choose larger powers of y, then this point where the exponential wins over will keep on shifting to the right. If I need even higher powers of the exponential to come in, become large, so that it wins over. Which means that if I if I go to larger quantum numbers v, then this point keeps on increasing. In fact, uh, in the notes, I have shown you all these wave functions and the probability distributions, the psi square plots. So if you look at the psi square plot, then the first wave function happens to be peaking at the center and as you go to larger ones, for example, this 20th wave function, v is equal to 20, it seems to be uh, like going like this, let me not draw all 20 but, oh, it's going to be symmetrical. Let me just draw 5 and show you the effect. Okay, so think that these are 20 of these. Okay. It's going more like this. This is coming towards the classical behavior. The particle, as a quantum particle, it spends maximum time in the center of this potential energy well. But when you go to higher quantum numbers, my probability of finding the particle is at the edges of the world. The classical one also, the maximum time that the classical pendulum spends is at the extrema. It quickly passes over the equilibrium point. That's again a, a, another uh, example of the board correspondence principle that at higher quantum numbers, you tend to observe classical behavior. Right? So if you if you look at uh, you know the decay, the decay is e to the power minus y square, and y is equal to alpha alpha. Huh? Ah, root of alpha times x. So if I Look at root of alpha, what is the value of that? Uh, alpha square is equal to mu k by h cross square. So if I have a large mass, right? The mass is large, then the decay is going to be very fast. Which means if I have large masses, they are not going to vibrate too strongly. Right? Or if K is large, K is essentially the spring, spring constant, which is my bond strength. If this K is going to be large. So if, if I ask you to calculate the K from that potential energy curve, the potential energy curve that we had drawn over here, you know that it's the curvature of this. Right? 
So if this curvature is going to be very, very, you know, if, if the width is going to be narrow and deep, then your k is going to be very large. If it's flat, 